The Holy Gospel according to John, chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. The question on which I'd like to reflect with you today is this, when is the right time? It's such a challenging question. I've named this sermon, When is the Right Time? I asked my son Chase, a high school teacher, as discouraged as any teacher at this point, I asked him with no context, when is the right time? And he immediately answered, sooner than we think, it's always sooner than we think. The venue for today's gospel is a wedding, an event that could go on for days. The problem is that the wine has run out. Another possible issue? is that Jesus' mother has decided that today is the right time for Jesus to come out as the Son of God that he is, and that his coming out should be celebrated by him fixing the problem of the wine running out. She said to him, the wine has run out. And it seems that she ignores his reply, my hour has not yet come, which suggests Jesus is not ready to come out by doing his first miracle at such a public celebration. His mother responds by turning her attention to the servants and telling them, do whatever he, Jesus, tells you. And it seems worth mentioning that no matter when Jesus thought it was the right time for him to come out in all his glory, that as a coming out miracle, Changing water into really good wine on possibly day three of a wedding would have been pretty spectacular. Such an unexpected miracle that would have not only provided drink for the guests, but it would spare the families of the bridal couple certain shame for not having enough wine. Once the water that likely was not for drinking but for washing once that water became not just wine, but the best wine, this wedding becomes a wedding fit for a king. Has there been anything in our lives that even remotely could compare to such an event at a wedding? In 1960, Interracial marriages were forbidden by law in 31 of these United States. These states banned marriage between whites and non-white groups, primarily black people, but some states also expressly forbid white people from marrying Native Americans or Asian Americans. Fortunately, in 1967, the Supreme Court overrode the states, making interracial marriage in the United States fully legal in every state. Loving versus Virginia ruled that laws that forbid the 
interbreeding of people considered to be of different racial types were unconstitutional. In 2016, the movie Loving was released. Loving tells the story of William and Mildred Loving, the plaintiffs in that Supreme Court case, who fought for their right to live as husband and wife all the way to the Supreme Court. The tagline on the trailer for the movie Loving reads, some love stories can change the world. Yes, indeed, they can. 20% of the families in this faith community alone would not have been able to marry were it not for that Supreme Court decision. That one decision affected the lives of people you know and love. Which is why it's important to know this about those same people that you know and love. U.S. News and World Report recently released the ranking of countries according to their policies and practices of racial equality. Of the 78 countries ranked, the United States, birthplace of the Black Lives Matter movement, finished among the bottom 10 countries for racial equality. And in November 2020, the FBI announced that hate crimes in the United States had risen to their highest level in more than a decade. The unending news stories of injustices toward our brown and black siblings cry out to us from our screens. They whisper wrongs in podcasts. They stare blankly from behind barred cells that they should never have been locked behind in documentaries and dramas. And just as you may have felt relief when I spoke about how Loving versus Virginia made marriage in this country lawful between all different ethnicities and colors, religions and cultures, we need to continue to consider our responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ as we see the violence and injustice that continues to be perpetrated against those who do not identify as white today. Because as we well know, just because something is made law does not always make it right. The Reverend Dr. Wilda Gaffney, whose lectionary we are using this year, has this to say about today's readings. The marriage metaphor that so often symbolizes the relationship between God and Israel and Christ and the Church has its roots in real human relationships. Marriage becomes a sacrament to make manifest the love of God in and between two people within a communal context. Marriage is socially constructed in and out of the Bible. Abduction and rape marriages, polygamous marriages, and hierarchical domineering marriages are all biblical, but few would call these epiphanies of God's love. She goes on to say, our understanding of the human person and sexuality has also evolved since the text was written and marriage continues to be shaped to make known the wideness of God's love. It is for this reason that Mary chose to reveal her son's glory at the wedding in Cana. In so doing, she leaves us with profound instructions for our Christian faith in verse 5. Do whatever he, Jesus, tells you. Further on in her notes, Gaffney writes, Depriving people of love, companionship, and sexual fulfillment flies in the face of what it means to be the church of God, who is love and created sex. 
And this is the yardstick against we must against which we must measure whether something should be lawful or not. Is our God, who is love, reflected in the law? Is the law to protect and gather or to subject and separate? Is the law being uniformly applied to all people since through Jesus there is no Jew nor Greek, no slave nor free, no male or female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. In today's gospel, as well as in other places, joy is widely associated with wine. The wedding toast is a tradition that has survived throughout history. And this can be a challenge for those living with addiction or practicing sobriety for any reason. Therefore, I think it's helpful to consider the meaning of the wine at the wedding at Cana and toasts at weddings today. The wine, the toast, which you can see, represents an abundance of joy, which might be harder to have and to hold. A glass of wine enabled the guests to literally hold up joy in a way that all could see. There was so much joy that it ran out and Jesus stepped up to make sure there was more. It is not so much the wine, but the joy that Jesus' mama wanted to be sure continued at this celebration. Joy is also a hallmark of the season of Epiphany. We are constantly being reminded that God is here manifest with us and that is indeed joyous. And so, just as we must ask ourselves, when is the right time to stand up and stand with those who are being unjustly persecuted? We must also ask, when is the right time to bask in joy? Because these two things need not be mutually exclusive. The work of freeing others to love and be loved, to live and work and thrive, is work that leads to joy whenever progress is made. As we continue Black History Month, I'd like to close with these words from our first national youth poet, Amanda Gorman, who wrote this about our country. And in it, I can hear relevance to human and holy relationships as well. She wrote, we are striving to forge a union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze, not to what stands between us, but to what stands before us. I suggest that despite the legion of challenges that stand between God's beloved people and justice at this time in history, that what stands before us is opportunity. And so again, I ask, when is the right time? Jesus would say, when people are wrongfully imprisoned, when people are celebrating joy and the wine runs out, when the empire would try to dictate what love looks like, it is the right time. It is always the right time to break down the walls that would prohibit those who love from living out their love publicly. It is always the right time to unlock the prisons that are filled with black men and women who are doing hard time for possessing a plant that is now sold on every corner in 18 states and is legal for medical purposes in 19 others. It is always the right time to manifest joy and get out the good wine. It is the right time to talk about racism in our government, in our economic structures, and in the church. It is the right time 
to ask those who carry heavy burdens to share their stories as we seek more understanding. Nothing changes unless good people recognize it is always the right time to show compassion and do the work of justice. If we take seriously Mary's direction to the servants at the wedding at Cana and do what Jesus says to do, it is always this. Love one another. And loving one another includes doing the hard work that is necessary to ensure freedom, to vote, to marry, to oppose the forces of evil at every turn. Because joy is part of life. It walks hand in hand with justice. It is the sound of people being set free.
Hmm. On this very day, St. Mark in Ypsilanti, Michigan, a sister church of ours, is holding their final worship service as they close their doors. Let us pray for the people in that community of faith. Lord, we thank you for the faithful ministries of St. Mark in Ypsilanti, for all the years they spent together living and loving and sharing your good news with the world. Be with them this day, Lord, as they mourn the closing of their church. May the ministries begun in them through you continue, and may their hearts be comforted as they find their way into, into a new community of faith. Amen. Thank you for continuing to support this ministry and the ministries of King of Kings in Ann Arbor with your offerings. If you would like to give at this time, you can do so by texting your offering to this number right here. It's just that easy. Let us pray. Refreshed by living waters, renewed by living bread, may we, your sons and daughters, by your own hand be led. Accept the gifts we offer. May they be multiplied. Unite us in your mercy and justice be our guide.